Welcome back, everybody, to the next Zoom in our organized by Princeton University's PCF. And we're very happy to have Dieter with us, Dieter Kopenat, who is the chief economist of the IMF and professor at Harvard. So as usual, I would like to give some background, some housekeeping, uh, what's coming up. Uh, we have Larry Summers uh, talking uh, on vaccine, how to accelerate the, the development of vaccines, about US-China relationships and the importance of it, and how the importance of resilience in the designing the future economy. On Monday, we will talk about with Bill Dudley about the Fed's longer term challenges. And then we have many more speakers coming up. Uh, we have Raj Chetty, others, uh, Esther Duflo, and many, many more coming up, uh, coming up soon. So as usual, I would like to go back and uh, give my introductory remarks on a similar topic Gita will talk about. And, you know, we have a global symmetric shock which might lead to so huge asymmetries because the amplifications are asymmetric. And I've shown this picture before where we have the COVID shock, the health shock might be hitting different countries differently, but it's a health shock which, you know, the virus doesn't distinguish between uh, person to person, but the recession might hit different countries very differently. In particular, it might hit uh, the emerging markets and developing economies much more hard than the advanced economies. So we have to see how this plays out. And the question is, how can we react in a particular way to make sure that the emerging economies are not hit um, disproportionately hard? And that's one of the uh, questions we would like to address. One thing which really hits the emerging economies is, of course, there are these huge outflows of capital, so capital flow flowing out, and it's just incredible. So this is a chart which I took from the International Institute of International Finance. And when you compare on the panel B, you compare the outflows here. So the red line is essentially the outflows from the recent crisis. You see that it's way more dramatic, more recently compared to previous crises. So the blue one is the great financial crisis. Uh, then you have, uh, you know, other um, center tantrum, which is the yellow one. But you see um, in 2013, but you see that the red one, the current crisis, is much more dramatic. What the graph does not show is that the whole situation stabilized in April. So was there was a stabilization going on, of course, because of policy intervention made a difference there. And, you know, should the question for emerging economies is to some extent is should they use up their reserves now, defend their currency? Should they go to the IMF and get some liquidity lines and use them this to defend the currency or should they just let uh, the currency go uh, and um, and this way, some investors will suffer, but also some domestic people uh, will suffer as well. So then in order to understand this, I would like to talk about some work I've done on the safe asset components or some integrated policy framework on the safe asset. And if you look at asset prices, typically when we look at asset prices, we see always just the expected discounted cash flow, future cash flow, taking the present value with some stochastic discount factor. And you get some cash flows, some dividends and interest. And that's how traditional asset pricing works. But of course, asset prices also give you some other service flows. And what are these service flows? So one service flow is that if you own an asset, like a US Treasury or some other government bond, you might be using it as a collateral and it might relax your collateral constraint. And given that it relaxes your collateral constraint, you're willing to pay more for this asset if it's a better collateral. Um, Formal terms, you have a Lagrange multiplier relaxing this collateral constraint, which boosts in the value of the asset. The aspect of the service flow I would like to focus on today is on the safe asset component, and a particular safe asset component. What's a safe asset? One aspect of a safe asset is it's like a good friend. And it means it's around when you need it, it's liquid, and it's, you can sell it at a fairly high price and a stable price when you need it since others will buy it at that time. And by doing so, even if though markets are incomplete and you have some financial frictions, it allows you to partially insure yourself against negative shocks because you hold a safe asset, might be a low interest rate you get on it, a very low interest rate. But when you're in a shock, you can sell it to somebody else. You can actually then convert it in something you can use. And what really matters is that you can trade and retrade it whenever you need it. You might need it, the other person might not need it, and then can swap this asset. If this asset is very good at that, then it has the safe asset component. And that's typically what the government bond has. So government bond has a good collateral value. You can also use it as a collateral, but you can also have the safe asset component where it gives you partial insurance through retrading 
What's important is that this asset has a huge market liquidity, so it's very easy to trade. The bid ask spread is not so high. And then there are other assets like money or the narrow sense of money, uh, where you know it relaxes the double coincidence of wants problem, which typically comes along with barter. That actually gives you an additional service flow because you come over overcome you know cash advance constraint, you get money in utility functional, and many, many different ways you can model that. So in a sense, you have different assets, and here I've depicted them, they have the old blue group of financial assets. Some of them are very good collateral assets, so they are also there. And among them, there are safe assets, and then you have a smaller group, which we would then regard as money. Today, what I would like to focus is on the safe asset component, um, the safe asset aspects. And of course, these assets have this additional service flows to trade at a higher price, which means they have a lower expected return. If the price is higher, you get a lower cash flow expected return. And the other problem, and that's essentially the key to understand, is that this B, the safe asset component, and the money component, uh, it actually can be going away very quickly. It can burst like a bubble, okay? Because there's a multiple equilibrium story, it can be. Uh, attached to one asset or can be attached to another asset. We might all switch from one asset to the other asset very quickly. And that's why there are multiple equilibria. And that's what we call the safe asset tautology, which means an asset is safe because it's perceived to be safe. Right? That's a tautology, it could be this asset or that asset. And of course, governments would love to have the asset as the safe asset. So going back to an earlier introduction we gave when we introduced Hyun Shin's presentation, you know, the, if you have capital controls on, you live in autarky, the risk rate in your country is the real risk rate, it's just the time reference rate. How much do you prefer a utility stream today versus tomorrow? That's the time reference rate, rho, plus the growth rate, the expected growth rate of the consumption stream. That's the Ramsey term, that's what uh, Ramsey has developed. If the economy grows faster, the real interest rate will be higher, minus a volatility term, the consumption volatility. Of course, I switched off all the complicated terms that I introduced last time with intertemporal elasticity of substitution and risk aversion because I just put the utility to log utility, everything is one. So then it becomes the simple formula. And let me also assume that the expected growth rate is just the growth rate itself, so it's just call it P. And uh, that's essentially how the risk rate is determined in equilibrium. That's also the safe asset if it's really risk free. Uh, and if it's safe on top of it, that's what coincides in this. Now, if I just bring the P term, which was this one, a little less G on the other side, I can also write the risk rate minus G is just rho minus the uh, volatility of consumption. And I make a little tilde on here indicating it's mostly disincratic risk. And that's where the service flow comes in. That's a safe asset service flow. It essentially says, if there's more idiosyncratic risk, the safe asset allows to partially ensure this um, idiosyncratic risk because you hold the safe asset and whenever you need it, you sell it. Somebody else does need it, you will buy it. And then you can each other, uh, insure each other, even though there are no insurance markets traded, but you can do it through the safe asset. And that's where the service flow of the safe asset is coming in. Now, if the risk rate is smaller than, than P, that's only the case if this rho, the time reference rate, is smaller than uh, the risk of um, in this economy, the consumption risk you're facing. But if this is the case, we know typically when the, the safe asset is, risk interest rate is very low relative to the growth rate of the economy, but then it can essentially run a Ponzi scheme on government debt. And that's, you know, very attractive. You cannot just print money or print bonds freely as you want because that creates problems. Then nobody will believe the return will actually go down because they dilute the old claims. But to some extent, you can actually issue money at a fairly cheap rate at a low interest rate. And that's a very attractive feature uh, to have. And many governments would love to have the safe asset feature and they will try and work hard to get the safe asset feature. Now, but once you have the safe asset, if you can issue this government bonds, of course, you can force your banks to buy some of that in order to establish a more easily safe asset feature and have the safe asset status as a country, as an emerging economy. What I ignored a little bit is here the risk, but of course, 
with capital controls still on, you also have the risk that things will go down, things might collapse, the state asset status might go away. So they have to add to it the risk premium which are put in here. How do you measure this? You can measure the sovereign credit spread and all this, that's a measure of this risk premium. So the condition is more tight now. It's, you know, you have the, the risk rate plus the risk premium has to be smaller than G. And of course, the risk premium can be negative. If you, uh, if in the US or Germany, the risk premium is negative whenever, you know, you go into crisis, uh, the, the safe asset appreciates, so it's a negative risk premium. So then it's more easy to satisfy this condition. If you're an emerging economy where the safe asset status might go away, that risk premium is positive. So it's more hard to satisfy this condition to have a safe asset status. So, but you can try to achieve it. And then the question is, now, if you take the app capital controls away, what happens? What's different? Now you go away from like China, you still have the controls on, now you lift the capital controls, what happens? And the big difference then is that you compete with your safe asset with US Treasuries. Okay, just pick the US Treasuries, of course, you compete with the German bond, you compete with the Japanese government bonds and so forth, but that's a big, big difference. Now, if you now, in emerging economy, you essentially jammed between two constraints. On the one hand, you have this uh, risk rate plus the risk premium has to be smaller than G, G is the growth rate of the economy, and R has to be at the same time be, the risk rate has to be larger than what you get on the US dollar treasuries. Okay, that's two constraints you have to satisfy. Once you open up um, the capital control, and what's important is now I put the risk premium in capital letters because it's now even higher because it could be that the US is hiking interest rates and then you essentially cannot satisfy your safe asset constraint anymore and the whole thing collapses. And a lot of this risk is endogenous and it might be due to self-fulfilling expectations. So the multiple equilibrium story is always there. So that's essentially uh, what's making the whole thing more risky it's because the risk premium and this is essentially if everything is more risky, the price of risk is higher. If the price of risk is higher, times the exogenous and endogenous risk, which is possible to the self-fulfilling element, there's an endogenous risk element to it, the risk premium is higher as well. That makes it harder to satisfy. You can see there's already multiplicity shining through and you're subject to speculative attacks. Okay, that's what we um, always have to live with in emerging economies and that makes the whole thing much more dramatic. So what can you do to satisfy these two equations much more easily and to help the emerging economies or developing economies to maintain the safe asset status or some partial safe asset status? And one is, of course, if the Fed cuts the interest rate, that's a big deal. That's what the Fed did on March 3rd, 2020. That reduces this jamming because one constraint becomes much more relaxed. Another uh, possibility is to make the speculative attacks which are possible uh, where you jump into the bad equilibrium to make them uh, more difficult for speculators to synchronize on that. So you can defend, whenever there's a speculative attack, you can defend it over this. If you have swap lines, so the Fed is use swap lines uh, in the ECB to other countries, uh, where then, you know, the national central banks can then intervene. That's at one defense line, but this defense line, the swap lines is mostly only given among the advanced economies, so it's tougher for the emerging economies. The emerging economies essentially can use their reserves through FX intervention. So whenever there's a temporary threat, you use your reserves in order to counterbalance it, in order to, you know, make it more difficult for the speculators to coordinate on an attack or to synchronize on, on an attack. The other thing you can do and what the Fed did is introduce the treasury repo facility such that emerging economies who hold a lot of treasuries can actually don't have to sell the treasuries then to defend the currency, but they can just bring the treasuries to the Fed, get dollars, and then use the dollars to fend off the currency attack. And finally, in April 22nd, the IMF created a short-term liquidity line uh, where then, you know, they also can go to the IMF to get some additional resources to fend off some attacks. Finally, another policy measure uh, you can do besides the FX interventions and using up your reserves is of course to impose some capital controls which makes it much harder for the capital to flow out and put also other macro potential measures uh, into place. So that's just to outline the different measures. So what this essentially gives you an 
integrated policy framework, and I know that the, the IMF is looking into, Peter can say a little bit more, where you can have, in fact, the consistency of the policy mix across all the different policy areas. How does it work? How does it not work? And it also gives you a framework which leads naturally to a dilemma, not to, dry, to a trilemma. So it's away from the Mandel Fleming trilemma. It is much more a dilemma world where in this framework, there are floating exchange rates. We have much more floating exchange rate uh, paradigm here. Like what Ellen Ray in some earlier work indicated, we have much more a dilemma world than a trilemma world. So even though your floating exchange rate, the monetary policy is really jammed between the two still, and there are some measures to mitigate that. And with the help of other entities, the IMF and further, uh, it will help. So let me just uh, conclude saying, in some, you know, there are some health shocks, which are symmetric across the globe, but because of some safe asset fragility, it might be amplified asymmetrically. So initial shock might be symmetric, but the, so the system we have, the global financial architecture we have, is not very symmetric, it makes it asymmetric. And it calls for a different global financial architecture. You know, I talked in some other work on close-based global safe bonds, how you can actually make it less reliant on interventions that you have to go to the Fed, you have to go to the IMF uh, to intervene, but much more self-stabilizing, stabilizing in an automatic sense that nobody has to intervene. Uh, that eventually the emerging economies don't have to ask for help, but they get it automatically. It's essentially integrated already. So as usual, I would like to stop with a, with a poll. And here's the, here are the poll questions. You're in an emerging market, developing economy, and what should they do? Do they need mostly grants and not liquidity support? So one argument, you can also choose multiple choice, uh, many of these questions. So they need mostly grants and just giving them loans and liquidity just exacerbates the debt overhang problem. Or is the liquidity support essential? Because typically if you have liquidity problems, the more into solve the issues, uh, you know, which way would you go? And the second question is, should emerging economies defend the currencies, use the reserves and the IMF liquidity lifelines and so forth to defend the currency? Or should they just let the currency go, make foreigners investor hit who are invested? Uh, but it might have the repercussions also inside the, inside the country where certain companies have a dollar debt, denominated the original sin, it might make things even worse. So let me see how the poll, let me run the poll for one more minute or 30 seconds. And the final question I should say, should the debt of the emerging and developing economies, should it be bailed out or should it be restructured? Okay. So of course, if you restructure, uh, you have the possibility to run up the debt again. And some people are afraid of that. Okay, so let me just summarize the results. So the first thing is grants, are needed, not only liquidity, 32% claim that. 68% claim liquidity support is actually good because typically if there are liquidity problems, they morph into solvency problems. So the emerging economy is the second question. So I should defend the currency or the, should the currency go, let go and let foreigners take the hit and also take the repercussions into account in their own country. That's totally split. We have 49% saying defend the currency, 51% say don't defend the currency. And the third question is, should you bail out the debt of the emerging economies? Only 20% think you should do that. You should restructure 80% think this way. So with this, uh, I pass on the floor to Gita. And let me close this here. Stop sharing and Gita will start sharing. Thanks again, Gita, for doing it. It's fantastic to have you on board. Uh, happy to, Marcus. If I knew you were going to talk about the integrated policy framework, then I should have uh, put that presentation together <laughs> for, uh, for today. But uh, let's go with what I have. OK, I assume you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, I was looking at some of your previous uh, uh, 
speakers and their presentations and uh, clearly everybody's focused on the COVID crisis at this point uh, and they've talked about many uh, issues already. Uh, I thought maybe a perspective that was missing that I could help with is uh, to look at the crisis through a global lens. Uh, and uh, um, since at the IMF we have a 189 member countries uh, for which we do surveillance and we pay attention to what's going on uh, on the ground in all these different economies, uh, I thought I could share with you some insights of what we're learning uh, about this crisis. So we, we coined the term the great lockdown for this uh, 2020 um, global contraction that we uh, projected of minus 3%. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just captures the fact that this is so unique and this is a crisis like no other. So you never had a period when countries have shut down and, are, and then reopened. So this is truly unique about that. Okay, so what's my plan? My plan is to talk about uh, three broad points. The first is, you know, in, in what sense is this a truly global crisis? Uh, and I'll have a few slides on that, make a few points about that. The second bucket is about uh, what are some of the features that are unique to this crisis and that seem to be showing up across the globe. Uh, so in that sense, I'm focusing more a bit on the symmetry here, but of course there's, there is also important asymmetry, but I think there are some unique markers of this crisis and you see that showing up uh, across the globe. And uh, the third is I, I will end with uh, some slides on the path forward, lessons learned, and what does that imply for policy making going forward. So let me jump in. So the first is on the fact that this is a truly global crisis. So, you know, the world has seen many crises over the last uh, several decades. And you had, uh, I mean, the IMF, of course, because as being a center of the global financial safety net, it, it sees these crises uh, up close. But uh, this, is, this is so uh, unprecedented because of the truly global nature of it. So you had the global financial crisis when you had, yes, it was, it did spill over to emerging markets, uh, but it, you know, it originated in the, in the advanced economies and it was, that's where the epicenter was, and that, that's where most of the hit happened, uh, even in terms of, if you look at the impact on activity. Uh, and what we're seeing now, of course, is, as we all know, this is a slide that everybody has, data that people have seen a million times over, is a global health shock, uh, which means that it's not about, you know, a country worried about not having enough demand from the rest of the world, or only that there are now fewer capital, less a capital flowing into your economy, but it is now a shock that hits you at home. So it is a very big supply and demand shock that hits countries at home. So in that sense, it is a, you know, you could think of this as a, a close, even if you were a closed economy, this would be a, a massive hit to your economies. So what you see, of course, across the globe is that, you know, if you look at the number of different, different countries around the world, uh, they've all gone through this phase of uh, increasing, um, uh, in, increasing number of cases, and then thanks to containment and mitigation measures, you've seen that come down. Of course, it varies. Countries have applied very different approaches. Um, uh, you know, some of them have been able to escape with much lower rates. And we saw that in Vietnam and in Hong Kong and Thailand, you see far less, fewer cases that came about. Uh, but also the, the epicenter has shifted. It was, you know, it was originally China, then, then it moved to Europe and you know, Italy being one of the main epicenters and then to the US. Uh, and now in terms of, uh, um, where the epicenters are, you see, for instance, very you know strong growth in Brazil and in Russia. Um, okay, so so this is what this is this is again. So like I said, that's that's one thing to keep in mind is very massive real shock in many economies of the world, and that's not necessarily something about lesser demand from the rest of the world. So in response to that, um, there was. A, a global lockdown that came along with it, which is uh, everybody uh, put in measures again to differing extent, but to, to mitigate and to contain. Now, you know, when it, when it first happened in China and, and there was very strong containment measures that were put in place, there was a sense that, you know, 
it's not going to be possible to translate that to many countries in the world. Uh, and while it hasn't shown up in the exact same uh, the same set of measures in other parts of the world. I mean, surprisingly, there have been very, very strong containment measures put in many parts of the world. Uh, and you see that again um, for uh, you know, a very large number of countries. Now, of course, people talk, uh, talk about Sweden as being, you know, for instance, an example of a country that's gone a different road. I'll, talk to, I'll show you some economic data for, for Sweden um, uh, on that. Now, this chart doesn't show you the, uh, the fact that uh, there's also been uh, this move towards uh, re reopening. So we, we run the survey and we ask our member countries, what, you know, uh, have you in this, re in this past week relaxed any previously put uh, mitigation measure uh, or containment measure? And if you look at the response to that, we're at 75% of countries responding that they have relaxed some measure. And of course, that doesn't mean they've gone back to uh, business as usual. Uh, they, there's variation in the amount uh, of the relaxation that's happened. Uh, you see much more happening uh, in Asia than in other parts. But, um, but the point is that there is a bit of a lock sink in, in the appetite, at least, to reopen. Now, again, you should keep in mind that this reopening is happening with still very high levels of cases in many parts of the world. So while there might be some flattening, it's, it's not as if the number of cases have come down. So this is when, uh, you know, if you speak to virologists they, they, and, and health uh, officials, they worry about the fact that we might be soon seeing another wave in the summer or in the fall. Um, but again, this is another global feature of this, uh, of this crisis. Now, of course, there's, it is a, a multifaceted crisis. It's, it's also, besides this big hit to your uh, domestic economy, uh, some countries hit, were hit with very major external shocks. You have commodity price shocks. Uh, and you have this, uh, you know, as we all know, but this, this big drop in commodity prices with some stabilization and improvement more recently. Some of that, a big chunk of that was, of course, this drop in global demand for in sectors that, uh, that uh, use oil. Uh, and so, you, that's, so that's the red portion of the bars. But then you also have um, the supply side, which is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the disruptions in the, with, the, uh, with OPEC plus uh, Russia, there's OPEC including Russia. Uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, there, was some, there was a breakdown of negotiations there and then some improvement and things have changed. But both, again, the demand component is very large. Uh, and on the right-hand side graph, you see what, uh, what Mark has pointed out, which is that you see a, um, you saw a very steep, quick decline in portfolio flows, right? Now, just to be clear, this is not the balance of payments. This is one component of capital flows to these, these markets, the ones that for which we see data very quickly. But I think what's clear is that it was the speed with which it collapsed as it compared to the, the, the GFC um, is, 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 is what's striking about this crisis, which is, again, a unique marker, which is the speed with which everything has collapsed uh, uh, around the world. Now, what I don't have on the slide, but of course, what is developing and brewing and is an important factor for where the global economy ha is headed is, are the, uh, the tensions that we are seeing growing between the US and China um, and you know, on many fronts. And that's, that, of course, is another factor that's going to weigh uh, on the outlook going forward. Okay, so just to, to again, just to bring home the truly global nature of this uh, crisis. Well, the left-hand side graph shows you, so we have the comparison of the great lockdown of 2020 to the global financial crisis of 2019. This, uh, this great lockdown is the first time uh, since, uh, you know, since the Great Depression, we've had both advanced economies and emerging markets in a recession. That did not happen during the global financial crisis. Of course, the, the magnitude of the collapse is also just that much uh, larger this time around, uh, as opposed to uh, in, in the GFC. So, the, so you know, these, this is a dramatic uh, difference. And again, to just to bring the point that no country is spared, if you see the, the right-hand graph, and here I've actually plotted two lines, which is the PPP weight of countries in recession and the fraction of countries with per capita growth that's below negative 4%. So, countries that are shrinking in per capita terms by 4% or more. 
uh, and you can see that almost you know, 60 percent of, of the economies uh, in the world are, are shrinking. So this is you know, in terms of implications for for, for poverty, for you know, general loss of income for vast numbers of people in the world, this is this is a very uh, this is a very uh, dramatic picture. Okay. Peter, can I ask just a quick question for Anusha Chari from UNC? Would like to know, you know, in the, in the GFC, the emerging economies were the engines of growth. So she would like to know, looking forward, which countries do you see will pull the global economy out from the recession? Which countries are most likely to be the engines of growth to help so, out? Is so it this is, you know, uh, the, the collapse we've seen is global, which means the recovery will come about again, and it's, it's going to come across from, from all parts of the world, right? So there's a difference between saying, you know, business as usual, advanced economies, potential growth rate, say 2% or less, emerging market and developing economies, especially if you look at emerging Asia, their potential growth rate is around say 5%, uh, driven a lot by you know, India and China and uh, other East Asian economies. Uh, and so then you would say, okay, the engines of growth in that sense, uh, if you think of a more medium long-term perspective would come from emerging, emerging markets. But, but at this point, we have advanced economies uh, as a whole, and since this is our advance, this is our April projection, and, and it's going to go down. So it's, we're going to be revising these numbers uh, yeah, on June 24th. We have a new update, and you know, looking at the incoming data, these, it's, it's going to be worse than what we have here. So obviously, the the near term growth is going to come back from the rebound. Should come back from the rebound in many of these many of these countries. Now the question to ask is that will this will the scars of this recession affect advanced economies and emerging markets differently. And because of that, is that going to then affect the, where, this, where the engines of growth are? Uh, and that, I, 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 if you look at advanced economies, they certainly have far more monitoring fiscal firepower to be able to uh, keep uh, firms um, afloat and to keep uh, workers uh, having sufficient levels of income and kind of match the jobs as much as possible. Uh, but that is, a, is much less doable in, in emerging markets. So, so, you know, and there is one argument that you could say that if you, think, if you think of the recovery phase and whether it's going to be a very quick recovery or slow recovery. Now, we if you keep the exception of China, uh, for most, of, for most, for a lot of uh, emerging market economies and especially for low income countries, we, we might see a very protracted period of slow growth and a very, uh, uh, you know, a slow recovery. So that was a rather long answer, but I, um, should I move on, Marcus? Thanks, yes, thanks a lot. Okay, so now let's move on to the common features of economic impact. And there are many common features, obviously, the, of this crisis, but I'm not going to go through the whole list of them. I decided to just pick a few uh, which, um, you know, behave differently during this crisis as opposed to the past. Some of them did not, but there are big question marks about how they would behave. Uh, and so I thought I'd give you a bit of a global perspective on, on, on these facts. So the first is, um, uh, is what's striking about this crisis is the very unique hit to services, right? Now that's what you would expect when you, when you lock people at home and you, they're not, they can't go out to, uh, in, you know, to, to, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, do for restaurants or go out for travel and tourism. Um, you know, other kinds of serve any services that requires uh, social interaction. If you're going to shut all that down, entertainment, um, you know, you know, going to retail, going to retail stores, malls, all of that. If you're going to stop that, that's going to take a big hit. That's not what we saw in previous crises. The previous crisis, if you look at manufacturing and services and compare the two, you saw a big drop in manufacturing uh, and a much a much smaller muted impact on services. And the reason is because in typical crises, you get a very big collapse in investment and manufacturing obviously is very affected by that. And consumption on the other hand tends to hold up relatively better. Um, and, uh, and so therefore services of many kinds hold up much better. But then if you look at my slide over here, you see the difference. So, you know, if you can compare country by country and this is for instance, the PMI manufacturing for February through April, the changes. 
Uh, and again, you know, this is still early days. This is uh, the hit was even has continued to be big. Uh, and you can see that the services uh, contraction was much bigger you know, for, for some of these countries, twice as big or twice as big as what we saw for, um, for, uh, for manufacturing. Now, the one exception is Sweden, as you can see there, which had, uh, which had a very different approach to this particular um, health crisis and, you know, did not have any kind of uh, uh, de jure lockdown. They did, they, it was not, you know, they did put measures in place to make sure that they had the health capacity to deal with, uh, uh, to deal as best as possible with the, with the health crisis, but there wasn't uh, the kind of lockdowns that we saw everywhere else in the world. And so, you know, Sweden does get hit. It has, uh, you can see a 15% drop in terms of the PMIs. That's not, to not, not that surprising also because they rely very heavily on external demand and the rest of the world is contracting, you have that. You see a, a drop in services, which obviously tells you that you have, uh, even if you don't have de jure lockdowns, you have de facto lockdowns, which people choose to voluntarily social distance. But again, you see a much more balanced, you service, you know, the, the collapse in services is, is uh, the ratio of the collapse in services between manufacturing and services is far more balanced in Sweden. Now again, again, these are all early days in terms of the data, but this is the, the picture that you, that, you, that you see. And it's true. Okay, let me reflect another question. Oh. It's about the manufacturing. Uh, Mark, can I just finish this one slide on services? Sure. And then that may be the time to ask. Okay. So what you see here, again, so just to talk, tell you that was, those were you know, countries in, in Europe, but this is, and this is looking at emerging markets more broadly and, uh, and advanced economies. And again, what you see there is this, uh, you can do country by country. So the first country on my left, our leftmost graph is India, and you can see the big collapse in manufacturing output and an even bigger collapse in services uh, on, on looking at the right-hand side graph. And again, you can compare country by country, and again, you see the same picture that there's services getting hit. The second other thing I want to point out is if you look at China, is the one country where you started seeing uh, uh, improvements. So you've actually seen um, you know, the, you can see this, the recovery coming through in manufacturing and services. But again, you see this big difference. It is manufacturing. If you look at China, which is CHN, and it has three bars, February, March, and April, and you see that the bars are increasing. You can see, you, you see that uh, you have this recovery in, uh, in, in April in, manuf in manufacturing. It's obviously partial because it's, you know, it's not making up for all the lost activity. But services is, is still recovering much more slowly. So that tells us something about what the recovery would look like uh, for, for countries going forward and which sectors would be hit much longer than others. But let me just talk here. Marcus, do you have a question? Uh, about services, there are also different parts of services. You know, all the IT is also part of services, which is booming, uh, of course, in many of restaurants, which, you know, is uh, really hurt. Uh, is there any way to disentangle the two effects? So do you think IT is just too small? And if you look at the bigger picture, so India is much more IT driven if you look at exports, while China is much more manufacturing output driven. Do you see any differences there? Yes, and it, it lines up exactly as you would expect, which is, uh, you know, things like uh, uh, medical services, uh, IT services, um, and all of that shows up entertainment online entertainment all of that shows up as doing much better than all the other services sectors do uh, but if you want to think in terms of where most of the uh, employment is for, for a lot of these countries it's not in those sectors but it's in in the state you know, the small retail the uh, uh, the the small restaurants uh, and you know there are islands for which tourism is the main activity. So so that's why overall, when you look at services indicators, you see a big uh, you see a big hit. But you're right that there, there is of course going to be the variation, and it comes in exactly as you would expect. Uh, which but but it, it raises a very good point, which is that for some countries, especially small islands that depend very heavily on tourism, there is a big question about how what where will the recovery come from? How long will it take? Because even if domestic travel eases up and people are willing to travel, I think international travel is going to be restricted uh, for a while and people might just choose not to travel as much internationally for a while. Second question that comes up uh, in, this, in this crisis is because we had a massive supply shock, which basically prevented people from going to work uh, and in case of manufacturing and, and uh, 
you know, that literally meant you could not get production done because you, could, you can't produce, uh, if you need machines, you can't do that from home. Um, and then you have um, the, um, um, uh, and then of course you had the demand side component, which is people also holding back, choosing not to, not to, to shop. Um, you could have some sort of a precautionary increase in, uh, in savings. Uh, and so there is a, there is a uh, the question that comes up naturally is that you know what should you expect to see for inflation? Uh, should we see inflation um, going up, or do we expect to see inflation um, uh, saying going down or saying deflation, if anything? Again, given that this is a massive supply shock, you could you could argue argue both ways. Uh, what we are seeing across the globe, and this is the picture here for core CPI inflation and the CPI inflation expectations for countries that you have data, again, looking more broadly than just advanced economies, is that if anything, this looks like an episode where, you know, worrying about runaway inflation is certainly not there. So, you know, it could be that the, there could have been far more deflation than what, we've, uh, what we have uh, uh, seen in the, what we're seeing in the data, and that's because of the big supply shock. I think that's a very fair argument to make. But overall, it seems that the, the effects that we're, you know, the dominating effect is moving in the direction of keeping inflation about where it is, uh, and, and in some countries drifting down. So I think if you look at the case of, for instance, Japan, you know, that has spent the last decade trying to move away from the zero bound in terms of inflation, you know, the numbers seem to be going back there. But I want to also be a little bit careful over here because you have to worry about what the data actually means when you're looking at these inflation numbers. Um, you know, what does it mean for a restaurant meal price that has it, that's what it is when people aren't actually going and having restaurant meals? Uh, or what does it mean for a, 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 a tourism company who lists their prices on, on travel uh, when people aren't exactly traveling? So I think there is a good data question, and as, as things reopen, we will see more about what's going on. But again, you know, you might ask, well, you know, emerging markets, maybe things are more different, more global, more supply chain breakdowns. You certainly see it in some sectors, like in food, there could be a spike. But again, you don't, uh, but overall, they look very much like uh, uh, advanced economies, if I, were to, if I were to spin one tail to it. A third thing I want to talk about is this question that has come up uh, very, uh, quite often, which is that are we seeing some kind of a disconnect in financial markets? Because financial markets uh, have recovered uh, quite strongly. So everybody knows that for the US, and you can see this figure over here. This is this, the stock market. This is the S&P 500, the dark blue line. Uh, you see that uh, it got you know, hit very hard in, the, in, in March, yeah, and then it's back. It's gone back up and you know, year to date, it's about whatever, five or six percent below where it was. So, uh, so a question that comes up as well, is this true just for the US or is it true more globally? I think an interesting contrast here is of course, if you look at China where you didn't really have a big hit on, on the stock market, say it fairly, it went down, but nowhere like any other, other markets did. If you look at, uh, for instance, other indices and I can look, you can you know, look at the, uh, what you see there, even for Brazil, that's the pink line, you had a big drop. Uh, and while it's not recovered, you know, back to where, anywhere to where it was before, but you see the trend is in the upward direction. So there is uh, this interesting feature that's about uh, financial markets doing, having a, 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 you know, showing what looks like a, a stronger prospect of a recovery than what you see in, in, these, in other markets, in the real market. Uh, again, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Again, here the uh, I also should, trying to keep keep an eye on my time here, but the um, uh, a, a similar thing you can look at is on sovereign bond spreads uh, for emerging markets, um, and what you see there this compares the the red dots are the current crisis and the GFC is the is the is the gray bar, and, and what you see there is. Um, uh, you know, yes, there has been an increase in spreads. For some economies, you can see it's gone up a lot, and actually Ecuador is off the charts, which is why we don't have a red dot there, but it's gone up by a lot. But again, for many others, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not gone up that much. Now, again, if you scale the, what was happening in terms of their, of, of their real activity in the GFC, which did not go down by much, as opposed to what's happening now for them relative to where we see these spreads are, again, there is a suggestion that markets are in 
in, in, a, in a different place. And of course, I'll talk about why we think markets are in different places just, just a little bit, just after my next slides. And similarly for exchange rate movements, there, is a, there, is a, there has been large depreciations. If you're a commodity exporter, especially you had very large movements, but uh, not overall, not, you know, not in the, of the kind, again, just by if you scale it by the size of the impact on real activity, these look, these look relatively small. Now you could ask, well, maybe this is because uh, these emerging markets have a lot more FX reserves and they're doing a lot more intervention. Well, some are, but it's not the case. It's not, if you compare to the GFC, it's not as if you see that there's a lot more intervention happening now. Again, this, I have to caveat that this, of course, that this is still early days and we have to, we have to see what happens we'll see as we get more data coming in. But to the question of how, how are financial markets doing relative to real markets, it's a much more broad-based story. So now what is, what is a big factor for this? And of course, I think a major important difference now is the strong policy response. The policy response has been very different this time around as opposed to in, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the GFC. Marcus, did you want to ask a question? Because I, no, I come back later. Okay. So you've had, um, uh, you know, you can see on monetary policy, of course, accommodative across the board. Um, uh, you know, in terms of unconventional monetary policies, which basically include, uh, you know, capture a lot of quantitative easing, uh, asset purchases of different kind, you can see that, of course, AEs are the vast, mid the overwhelming majorities of advanced economies are doing that. Uh, emerging markets do less of that. They still rely much more on cutting rates and providing liquidity and much less of uh, asset purchases. But you are seeing the uh, one or two countries, few, a few countries uh, venturing into that space. So the right hand graph basically tells you that with rates having come down everywhere, you know, we have obviously advanced economies um, with policy rates less than 0.5%. At this point, it's you know, close to 90% of the countries in the, in the advanced economy sample. EMs still have more uh, monetary policy space from an interest rate point of view. Now, the area where things are different uh, there's something that's similar but still different is on the fiscal policy side, which is you see, um, if you look at the G20 countries here on the left-hand side, you clearly, you know, the, the more advanced economies have done a lot more discretionary spending. And of course, for the, some, of, some of the advanced economies that don't look like they're doing very large discretionary spending, it's because they have very strong automatic stabilizers. Uh, on the other hand, emerging markets are also spending, but they are more constrained by how much they can do. Uh, and obviously this reflects their ability to um, access uh, markets. Uh, another thing that we have to keep in mind, again, this is, uh, again, be, being from the perspective of, of looking at many countries around the world is that, you know, the advice of course, is that in this crisis, you should support workers and firms, uh, do it very quickly and do it very broadly. Uh, for when, you, when you're looking at emerging markets and low-income countries, a major challenge is the large informality that they have. And, uh, you know, being able to, to get the money into the hands of uh, informal workers requires a very different strategy than, from, than what would be required in the advanced economies. So we spend a lot of time actually thinking about what are the best ways of getting money into, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, policy advice that we built on how to use, uh, you know, digital payment schemes to, to expand existing schemes, the creative ways of getting money as quickly as possible. But this is not cheap, it's going to be expensive as one of the numbers there show you. Uh, but this is a challenge. I think this is a challenge that it's not, not just now, but even coming out of this crisis. How are you going to deal with this very large informality that you have? In past crises, the informal sector was a shock absorber. Uh, because that's what happened in, emer in, in emerging and developing economies. When you have a crisis, you know, the, the informal sector becomes a shock absorber. That's where people go and get some of their income. But the, given the nature of this crisis, it's hit the informal sector equally hard and maybe more than, than some, even the formal sector. Peter, sure. there's a question about this informal sector. <clears throat> well, where do you see the optimal policy mix towards the informal sector in particular? Is this also an opportunity to bring the informal sector into the formal sector saying, okay, if you now, from now on declare your business, you get some tax credit now, but in the future I have you and essentially you have to pay taxes. Is this an opportunity, in, do you see it? Or, and in more generally, what is the optimal policy mix? No, I, 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 yes, so, you know, the informality takes many forms. So there are informal workers that work in formal firms. Uh, so there are, you know, uh, kind of uh, 
for workers on very, very informal contracts that work otherwise on, on, on forms that are actually registered, they are much more easy to reach uh, using existing tools. The bigger problem is the self-employed, which is the vast majority of the informality. Uh, and to reach, to reach them, uh, you know, the idea is that it's not just, it's not about registering yourself or, or, or being visible as a firm, but it's just going to you like an individual. So you give you cash transfers. So that's what, that's the strategy that's being followed here is to give, uh, is, is try to get cash transfers. And different countries have different schemes through which they give uh, cash transfers for different reasons. And so the, the whole, the, in these past couple of months, what the optimal strategy has been basically very quickly adapt the existing schemes to be able to reach a much broader set of people, to get rid of all conditionality that typically is associated with certain kinds of transfers and, and reach them much more quickly. But again, like I said, an important constraint is, for instance, we did this measure of the fiscal cost of a two-month transfer to informal workers in, for emerging markets, and depending upon which ones you are, that cost is about 2.2 to 5.7% of GDP. Those are very large numbers. Um, so, you know, this is not, problem is not going to, be, I don't think there's an easy, uh, easy solution here. They get, there are transfers in kind that, that are being done. But, you know, if this crisis continues much longer, you can see that the financing needs are going to just go up, uh, even yeah, go up tremendously. So, I just wanted to step back and think about, you know, from, as the IMF, we obviously are, uh, are, uh, our mandate is about multilateralism, uh, and so we, you know, one of the things that we are we are, we pay very close attention to is how do policy measures by one country impact the rest of the world. I mean, that's what that's kind of one of the roles, one of the uh, roles that we play is to look at externalities, spillovers, and all of that. Of course, in this price, the number one uh, externality is not is not, uh, um, you know. Uh, foreign exchange intervention problem or a capital flow problem, you know, there is a capital flow problem, but it's not so much that, but it's the health externality, uh, which is that, you know, if, if there are countries in the world that do not have the financing they need to, uh, to contain the virus and to treat it and treat people, then of course that has implications for the rest of the world. Uh, more, I, I, further, in terms of medical supplies, what happens when a vaccine is actually uh, found and how do we make sure there's enough production and distribution to, for the world? Uh, you know, all of those are issues that are obviously multilateral and need a global approach, uh, but of course is going to go beyond the IMF here. The second is a question of what sometimes, what happens in a crisis is you have concerns about beggar thy neighbor policies, right? So the concern is, are you trying to steal demand from the rest of the world by keeping your interest rates too low and your exchange, your exchange rates too depreciated. That obviously is less relevant as of now in this crisis because you just had a complete breakdown in global trade. Uh, so that's a different, you know, it's a very different crisis in that sense. But of course we do worry about protectionism uh, and uh, that this, this crisis is going to lead to greater protectionism. Uh, people are going to, you know, Optimally, they might choose to move production home, but then on top of that, there could be all kinds of uh, tariffs imposed on and uh, restrictions on exports of food and medical supplies and, and all of that. And so I, I think that is a real risk that we have to uh, pay uh, attention to. Okay, so looking forward and next steps. So again, like I told you, about 75% of countries in the world uh, said say that they are easing restrictions, right? And they're easing it again at very different points in their in their uh, pandemic cycle, uh, but they are easing it nonetheless. Uh, so 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 we are now, and I think what we what we know is that from now until uh, at least the end of the calendar year, for sure, there is going to be no medical medical solution or vaccines. Um, so you know. The, the timeline is that 2021 is when we will see some sort of a serious medical uh, solution. So with countries reopening with not enough herd immunity, there is the real risk or that you might have for the waves of this, uh, this uh, pandemic. Now, maybe we, the world is better prepared for it because it has seen this done out before. They know how to treat patients that come in much faster. Uh, people know how to respond much more quickly. They know how to self-distance. They know how to take precautions. So obviously it will not be the exact same way if it happens a second time around. 
but this can't be ruled out. So when I talk, when I'm talking and looking forward, I'm talking about this next period where the uh, health crisis is not over, uh, in the sense that there is no vaccine, there is no herd immunity, uh, but and so we can have second waves. Uh, but at the same time, we countries are reopening, so they are moving from the phase of complete lockdown and you know, full protection to workers and firms to the stage. So what can what can we say about what these next stage should look like? But before that, in terms of what countries do, I just want to point out the profound uncertainty about the path forward. Uh, this is again a figure from our April World Economic Outlook. The purple line is the the path of uh, global real GDP if the crisis had not hit, right? So if we didn't have this uh, uh, this uh, health crisis and its ensuing uh, uh, impact. So we, that's where it would look like. The, the black line is what we had projected in April as one of our scenarios, but then there were multiple scenarios depending upon whether you have more outbreaks or less outbreaks. So you can see that, uh, you know, wh whether you go back to trend, how long it takes to go back to trend. This is until 2021, so it's just this year and next. How far you are from it, how much loss of activity do we have is potentially moving down, basically. I think there is tremendous uncertainty here. And in some sense, the, what we are going to do uh, in, as, poly, as what policymakers are going to do is going to be guided by what this path uh, looks like. But here's, here are some basic ideas inside for what policies for the reopening phase look like. I think what's absolutely uh, clear is you need to minimize health uncertainty because, they, like I said, there's no medical solution at this point. Uh, you, if you want to reopen and you want people to be out there uh, feeling confident about interacting and, and uh, um, uh, and, uh, and sufficient spending happening, then you have to minimize uh, the, uh, the health risks. Uh, and I think what it se seems to be clear from looking across the globe is the most least economically disruptive way is through widespread testing, uh, contact tracing, you know, using measures like masks and social distancing. Um, that is, will be, will be that, that I think is, is fairly accepted as best practices. Second, it has to be well communicated. The, the, with the health crisis not going away, you have to be able to communicate and provide confidence to people to be able to have a good sense of what's coming. Um, then countries should, op should, should be open to very different strategies and trade-offs. And why do I say that? I said, well, you know, in the beginning of the health uh, uh, pandemic, but the beginning of the pandemic, you know, there was a bit of a copycat reaction, which is countries did exactly what they saw somebody, some other country do. And that is natural when you do not know how this crisis is going to play out, and this is a completely novel virus. But I think we understand now that there are features, you know, the, the age distribution matters, the ability to self-distance matters on a, on a, you know, on a voluntary basis, uh, the strength of the health capacity data matters. I mean, all of these, and these vary across countries, so the strategy should be uh, tailored. And of course, there has to be a global effort for production and distribution of medical supplies and vaccines, I think that will be the number one priority. What about helping supporting workers and firms? Now, in the peak of the crisis, the, the, the goal was to keep workers and firms matched as much as possible and to you know, provide funding to firms so that they maintain employment. Now, if this crisis goes on for longer and not just goes on uh, for another six months, but say it goes on into the next year, then you have to think about the support taking a different form, which is that you actually want to ease, you want to be able to reallocate workers because there are some sectors that are going to be permanently hit. They will need it to shrink uh, and you will need labor to move out. So you don't want to keep firms and workers matched artificially. You will need to allow uh, movement. Uh, and, and there are many countries where labor market flexibility is, is not great. And it, this is going to be a big problem. This is, can be one big source of scarring uh, going forward. We want to move from uh, giving unemployment to obviously giving hiring subsidies. Uh, the case for corporate solvency support will also weaken because you, you probably will focus on strategic and systemic firms. You can't keep everybody else alive. So the strategy should be more about how to bring firm entrepreneurship back up very quickly, even after they've gone through bankruptcy. And so that should be this, the, the emphasis. Uh, and you know there could be a demand push, which is public investment uh, and for you know, more general public investments, but that you know, we want to tailor that to make it job rich. Uh, and so typically infrastructure investment does that job. And if you can that complement that and make that green, 
that obviously you can have a, a job risk recovery that also benefits the client. And I have there, which is a new generation of temporary automatic stabilizers. What do I mean by that? By that I mean that because there could be a, a second phase where again, some target lockdowns happen, you know, some kinds of transfers, the new transfers that have been put in the system, you should be able to trigger those very quickly. So that's the sense in which I'm saying that they should be temporary uh, automatic stabilizers. And of course, again, stability of the financial system is really important. Uh, it's important to have funding to meet critical spending needs of developing economies and international liquidity. So Marcus, these are some of the points that you made early on. Just to flag, the IMF has provided about 59, I think maybe 60 countries now, emergency financing so far. We have over 100 countries requesting. We're providing debt service relief, uh, liquidity lines, credit lines. Um, you know, there's a G20 debt initiative. The FX swap lines have played a very important role, I think, in, in you know, the, the monetary policy measures in the advanced economies or the reserve currency issuing economies has had, a, has had a positive impact in terms of calming markets uh, in the rest of the world. But again, much more would be, uh, is quite likely needed. So I'm just gonna end with this last slide and uh, not try, try not to take up too much more time. This is opportunities and challenges. I think people can look forward even further. Um, you know, there's been, this, there's been a, a complaint of not enough productivity and uh, maybe this time can be different in terms of technology and innovation. I think what people are quite impressed by is how quickly Innovation is happening at this time. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, this, the, the, the collaboration in the terms of the speed with which you, there's new inventions coming out there, the, the fact that the speed with which it's being adapted, you know, the technologies are becoming more general purpose with all of us knowing how to use all of Zoom and everything much more quickly and so on. So maybe we could be in a new era of a productivity increase. Uh, obviously, uh, there is uh, there is an argument for, you know, this is not going to be the last natural disaster and uh, climate change is a big concern. But again, I do, uh, since I'm almost out of time, I'm just going to just list these. These are the kinds of issues we're also thinking about at the IMF, about you know, inclusive growth, fintech, digital economies, mainstream academic uh, preparations, so the next time we're around, one's less surprised. Um, and of course, all of this requires a greater global cooperation. So with that, uh, I will stop, Marcus. Thanks a lot, Peter. Can I just have a concluding question uh, from the audience? Um, one is, you mentioned a lot of policy initiatives. Uh, you didn't mention SDRs. So some people would like to know, is this also in the cards or that's not really the biggest thing? And then you ended up with a very optimistic note. Um, Paul Goodman essentially was arguing we should consider a whoosh recovery, like a Nike recovery. And uh, his argument was that, you know, this was an external shock. There was no internal imbalances beforehand. And whenever we have recession driven by an external shock, we will come back much more quickly compared to recessions, which are due to imbalances building up beforehand. Of course, there's some countries where there were build balances building up over debtedness is uh, one key word here. Uh, and then in your scenarios, you don't have a, a path where you go back to the old trend line but there might be because of this technology aspects, there might be a more optimistic view as well. Would you rule out that we go back to the old trend line? Okay, so let me answer the questions backwards. To your second question about the, the swish recovery. Um, so in April, if you look at our projection for April, that, that, it, that's only for 2020 and 2021. But if you, if you, you know, try to pull that line out, that looks like an IP swish. So that's exactly what it is. Um, actually, we had thought about this, whether we should call it that, and then we decided not to. But anyway, but now everybody's using the swoosh word. <laughs> the, um, uh, I, I think, I think the, uh, the, you're absolutely right that, you know, we've put countries in lockdown, we put people in lockdown, you reopen, there's going to be pent up demand. It's not as if pre-existing balance sheets were in bad shape. So there should be a much faster recovery. So that's the argument for, you know, for some of the optimism that there will be. But there is a second piece to it, which is one that, as we saw in China, people's consumption spending on services is coming much more slowly. So there is still this hesitancy because of the health crisis uncertainty is still there. So that's kind of dragging a bit, dragging. Secondly, uh, you know, we have 
because of the kinds of firms this has hit, these small firms, they don't really have the ability to survive for very long. Now they're getting a lot of support, so maybe they will, but you're going to see bankruptcies. And you've seen, and, for, and then there are some industries which is just going to be completely different, travel, and we know that. And you're seeing uh, big, uh, big shifts over there. And then global supply chains. Global supply chains are broken just because of the way this crisis has played out. And it's going to be an interesting question to see how that, how that comes back up. So, you know, unlike a natural disaster where you say, well, okay, there's that, and then people come back up, because of the health crisis has not been solved yet, and there's that uncertainty yet, which then compounds the problem of how long firms and workers can stay the way they are, unmatched and, and, and not having enough revenues, that, that can stress things out. But again, these are all scenarios. And, and in the beginning, I think I was also of the view that things could improve much faster, but I think we have to wait and see. Um, on, the, on the SDR question, it's, it's absolutely something that's on the table and has been discussed. Um, uh, there is no uh, consensus on it. I mean, the membership has to agree. Uh, and there is no full consensus at this point. But again, let's just be clear about what the SDR can do. Now, when you, when you do a, a general SDR, an increase in SDR allocation, most of that goes to countries that don't need it. So it goes to, because it's proportional to your quota. So it goes to the very large economies. And it does not go to the low income countries in, in, in very large numbers. So, so there's another way to engineer the same kind of uh, uh, allocation of SDRs to the low income countries, which is to have the, uh, the countries that don't need it, that who, their existing SDRs, the countries that have existing SDRs or wealthy economies who don't need it, who can then uh, you know, loan that out to uh, the low income countries. And if you look at the numbers, that you could come up with exact similar amount as opposed to ha as having a general allocation. So this, this second strategy, there is uh, uh, certainly a, a lot of appetite for, and, and that's something that uh, we're working on at the IMF. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Akita, again, for this nice talk. And uh, I hope to see all of you again on Monday with Bill Dudley. He will talk about inflation and deflation and all the other threats to the Fed's balance sheets in the longer term. Thanks again and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye, Gita. Bye-bye. Thanks, Marcus.